It might be hard to imagine, but at one time, Detroit was viewed as one of the most glamorous and exquisite cities in the world. Hi everyone, Ken here. Today we are exploring the Hecker House in Detroit, Michigan. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. In 1846, Frank J. Hecker was born into a middle-class Michigan family. His parents wanted to see him succeed at life, so they uprooted the family and moved to St. Louis, Missouri, which had some of the best schools at the time. Just as he was about to enter college, the American Civil War broke out and he enlisted with the Union Army. This gave him invaluable life experience as he learned the ins and outs of land surveying. Just after the war, he was hired by the Union Pacific Railroad to oversee the construction of a new line through Indiana. At no fault of his own, the project failed, but he had done everything in his power in an attempt to salvage the project. The higher-ups at the Union Pacific Railroad were so impressed by his resourcefulness that they invited Frank to join them in managing the company from Detroit, Michigan. By 1884, he was named the president of the Union Pacific Railroad, and from the top of the industry, Frank was able to identify a gap in the market. He teamed up with his longtime friend, Charles Lang Freer, to found what would become the Peninsular Car Company, manufacturing custom train cars for individuals and companies. Even though being the president of a rail company made Frank rich, it was not until he founded his own manufacturing company that he became one of the wealthiest men in the Midwest. In 1888, Frank set out to build his dream house. He purchased a premier lot at the corner of Ferry and Woodward in Detroit and hired Detroit-based architects Scott Camprey and Scott to design for him an imposing mansion in the Chateauesque style. The 21,000-square-foot limestone palace was flanked by three-story towers and wrapped in a colonnaded loggia. Each window surround was carved from stone and boasted elaborate relief work. No surface was left unadorned, from hand-sculpted balustrade to distinctive copper finials exaggerating the height of the already steeply pitched roof. Approaching the home from the street, you would make your way towards the front door below an elaborate entablature. Here you would find the entrance encircled by stone relief work depicting seashells framing the wrought iron double doors. Entering the home, you would arrive in the vestibule, passing through a colonnade towards the great hall. This space was finished out with floor-to-ceiling wood paneling and flanked by arcades concealing a laurel motif in their arches below a hand-stenciled coffered ceiling. To the side, the grand stairs gently rose towards the second floor, with their balustrade imitating the arcade on a miniature scale. To one side of the great hall, the dining room rounded out with curved wall paneling below a low-profile dome, decorated with gilded plasterwork radiating from its center. Tucked away to the side of the dining room, we will find the tea room set within the limestone tower. To the other side, the music room, also known as the white and gold room, was finished out with white painted wall panels adorned with gold leaf on each raised detail. The fireplace was crafted from Nubian marble and onyx, which glowed as flames flickered in the hearth. The parquet floors continued into the parlor, carrying the same themes of white and gold finished on the walls and broken up with damask wallpaper in each paneled section. Above us, on the ceiling, a blue and white mural of a cloudy sky was contained within a gilded cartouche in which a gold-leaf plaster medallion surrounded electric light bulbs. Making our way back across the Great Hall, we will find the library, with an elaborate frieze running below the coffered ceiling. To one side of the floor-to-ceiling mahogany fireplace, we will find built-in glass pane bookcases containing Frank's antique and rare book collection. Though, not all the rooms were as ornate. The billiards room offered a retreat from the busy patterns of the public rooms, with only the decorative mantle and refined cornice to break up the otherwise blank walls. While we make our way towards the more private end of the house, we will find the back staircase cozied up to an ingle nook. Here we will make our way upstairs. Directly above the dining room, we will find Frank's daughter's room decorated with light, delicate furniture. Her room opens into the tower, which she used as a playroom. Opposite of this room, we will find Frank's bedroom, decorated with dark, heavy furniture below a hand stencil cornice and ceiling. Attached to his room and the tower opposite his daughter 
the sitting room allowed for a quiet retreat. As we continue the story, we will see more photos of the house. Frank hosted large parties in the mansion, even entertaining two U.S. presidents for dinners and balls. In 1927, he unexpectedly passed away. The family held on to the house through the Great Depression in the hopes that Detroit would recover, but as the city continued to decline, they gave up their hope and sold the house in 1947. It went on to be used by the Smiley Brothers Music Company, who converted the mansion into a sales office and rehearsal space. During this time, significant changes were made to the interior, most of which were reversed by the following owners, a law firm which purchased the house around 1990. They painstakingly restored the house both inside and out before selling it to Wayne State University to be used as the Turney Alumni House. Which room was your favorite? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to say a special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on the screen, and show your support for the production of these videos, join our membership program for just $5 per month. I'll see you next time on This House.